Hey everyone, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Am I Missing Something? It's Matt. And it's Zach. This is the show that's more of a commentary platform for us to kind of just long-winded talk about a particular subject or band or, you know, really anything that's on our mind musically. And Zach came up with this one. And yeah, and I will admit that this topic is a little unusual because it would normally be something that we touch on in uh, our other series, Two Minutes to Review, where we compete to give the longest review in two minutes. As you all know by this point, Ozzy Osbourne released a brand new album, Patient Number 9. And we we're going to review it and do our standard review, but as I was listening to it and just all the hype around this album, I had a lot of mixed emotions. A little background, if in case you're not aware of this, not only is this an Ozzy Osbourne record in 2022, I mean, which, let's be real, the fact that Ozzy has, is releasing new music uh, still is pretty you know, phenomenal. And performing halftime shows, too. And performing halftime shows at NFL games that NBC don't show. But he basically enlisted an all-star group of musicians. I mean, with Ordinary Man, which we reviewed, we did a two-minute review episode on Wait, even before, right before the pandemic, actually, even with that album, he had gathered a stellar lineup of musicians to play with him with Def McKagan from Guns N' Roses on bass, Chad Smith from Red Hot Chili Peppers on drums, uh, and his producer Andrew Watt handling the guitar duties, plus a few little guest appearances from Tom Morello and Post Malone. Well, I mean, this album, he upped the ante because I guess he heard complaints about Andrew Watt's guitar playing because he added in a slew of incredible guitar solos from legends, from everyone, from Tony Iommi himself, to Eric Clapton, to Jeff Beck. He even brought Zach Wilde back to handle a good chunk of the songs. I think he plays rhythm on most of the songs uh, and does solos on a few of them. He even got Mike McCready from Pearl Jam to do a solo on this album. So you basically are laying down the groundwork for what could be the best hard rock album of the year. And as the album came out, I'm reading reviews that are saying, yeah, Ozzy still got it. So I have to ask myself, I'm listening to this, and I'm like, huh, what am I missing here? Why am I, who, mind you, am a huge Ozzy fan, not just a Black Sabbath fan, a huge Ozzy fan, why am I not loving this? Why am I not into this? And it's hard for me to pinpoint because I... It's not bad album. On paper, everything that they do should make me excited and happy. Why am I so disinterested in what I'm hearing? Why am I so eh about this? And then it leads me to going into the whole down the rabbit hole of, am I just a jaded prick? Am I? <laughs> You're opening yourself up for that comment on the evil. internet? Yeah, let us know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Epic Footnote. <laughs> is Zach a dick? Uh, <laughs> X is sit down. Um, <laughs> like, am I expecting too much from Ozzy Osbourne in 2022? Should I just hmm. am I should I just be happy to have an Ozzy album that sounds somewhat Ozzy, or or am am I being too nitpicky here, or? Do I have a legit reason to be so eh, about this record? So, so Matt, please tell me what I'm missing here. <laughs> I mean, I don't think you're missing a lot. One of the first things that I thought of, even before you brought this up to me, when I heard the album was, and I'm going to compare this to a very different album, and I'll tell you why one works and why one doesn't work. So I think the reason why this album may not work for some people, including you, is because it's Ozzy and you're expecting a certain thing from Ozzy. And it sounds like there's a whole bunch of guitarists that are trying out to be in Ozzy's band. They recorded it and put out an album because let's, I'm going to be completely honest here and I know I'm going to get trashed by everybody who loves this album. Patient number nine, I hated it. Absolutely hate it. It doesn't sound like a great song. If you ever wanted to know what Ozzy would sound like in a 90s grunge band, grunge band uh, that's what Immortal sounds like. I wasn't crazy. Thank you for calling that out, too, because I and it's not just because Mike McCready's on it. It sounds like Ozzy trying to do a Pearl Jam song from Ted. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. Thank and you for calling that out. I thought I was going crazy. No, not at all. Parasite sounds okay. I mean, it's not the greatest song in the world. I'm going to skip Tony Iommi for a second and talk about Clapton. Clapton is the only person on this album who has, I don't remember if he's ever worked with Ozzy, but who you wouldn't expect an Ozzy song to work with, but I think it works here because Clapton is just that phenomenal of a guitar player. Nothing against Jeff Beck or Mike McCready, but Clapton, the blues guy, you know, he makes it work. I like the Clapton song. A Thousand Shades is a better Jeff Beck song. It's not great. And then, you know, the Zach Wilde songs, I, Mr. Darkness, I think, is the highlight of the album. I love that song. So, actually, can I step in for one second sure. and talk about Mr. Darkness? Because initially, yeah. when I first heard it, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. But then it kind of goes into, and, and I'll touch on this because you oh, you were going to say come back to Tony Iommi. Mm -hmm. But my problem is that it goes from being an awesome Ozzy song to trying to replicate Black Sabbath in, out of nowhere in the middle of it. and. That's kind of what that doesn't me bother off. me. But here's what kind of pisses me off about that. And also what kind of so the songs that he does with Tony Iommi, they're great sounding Black Sabbath songs that they never recorded. But yes. my problem is I don't want that on an Ozzy album. I know that sounds hypocritical. To me, Ozzy in his prime, and we can go down that whole rabbit hole of whether Ozzy's been in his prime for a while now or not. But Ozzy solo stuff sounds very is not the same as Black Sabbath. There's a doomier sound to Sabbath. There's gloom in it. Ozzy, at the peak, at his peak as a solo artist, there is a bounce to it. There's optimism to it that, granted, you can argue that in the 90s, he went down the bleak kind of trying to capture Sabbath sound again. But like, I don't want Ozzy to make Black Sabbath songs about Black Sabbath. I want I want an Ozzy solo album. And I think going back to the problems with all the multiple guitarists is that you, you mentioned that how they're all trying to audition to be Ozzy guitars. To me, it's like, well, no, now these guitars are just coming in and they're doing a Pearl Jam song because it's Mike McCready. Even the Clapton song was like, I love. it's nice to hear Clapton try to replicate his Cream era, but there's no consistency. It feels like Ozzy is guest appearing on his own album. See, now, I don't so much have a problem with bringing in a bunch of musicians and doing different songs. Granted, hip-hop is all about bringing in different rap artists, and they do their own verse and whatnot. And it, it works in, in albums. You know, when albums are good, it doesn't work when albums are bad. You know, the typical. However, what I'm going to say, let me just finish with the yeah, Iomi sure. stuff. The Tony Iomi songs, No Escape From Now – Depending on how you – like Zach just alluded to, depending on how you feel about Black Sabbath being on an, an Ozzy album is exactly what that song is. It's it, it's a Black Sabbath song that was never recorded, and now here it is. And I don't have a problem with that so much, but you know, a, a lot of people could have opinions. And then I feel like Degradation Rules, it was just kind of okay. It wasn't you know, anything to write home about. And then let's not even get into the last three tracks of this album because I thought they were awful. So I'm glad you brought that up too, because here's where I'm going to also acknowledge that I am a hypocrite. Because you like those songs? No, no, no. I'm beating the internet here. Because remember how I was telling you I want an Ozzy album? I want yep. Ozzy solo stuff? Well, here comes Ozzy with Dead and Gone and God Only Knows, which could have been songs off of 90s era Ozzy, which... I'm not saying that you know, they are peak Ozzy, but there's some great stuff that Ozzy did in the 90s or early 90s, I should say. Osmo like These songs could have been on Osmosis, which is an underrated Ozzy album. But here I am listening to these songs going, eh. So am I being, I, and this is me going like, here I am saying, I want an Ozzy album. And then here comes Ozzy with Ozzy songs. And I go, eh. Am I just someone who you can't win with at this? Like, am I just those jerks who d damned if you do, damned if you don't? Um, I don't think so, because I let me let me finish out my thought here, sure. because now the reason why Ozzy's album doesn't work is the reason why Santana's comeback album Supernatural does work. OK, mm. so when you think about Supernatural. Obviously, everybody thinks of the song Smooth with Rob Thomas. Santana did not try to be his 
70s and 60s progressive guitar playing self on this album. He took a different mix of musicians and turned it into different sounding songs that he happened to be playing guitar on. He added the guitar flavor to the song with his excellent guitar playing. Now, there are songs on here that do call back to what Santana originally was, like um, Corazón Espinado, Migra. There's um, uh, da, 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 African Bamba. There's a lot of songs on here that call back to Clapton – or not Clapton, excuse me, Santana doing his Santana thing. But then songs like Maria Maria and Put Your Lights On with Everlast and Love of My Life with Dave Matthews and even Eric Clapton coming and playing the song The Calling with him. These are songs that were crafted for the musicians on the album. And it comes together in this just very memorable album, which brought Santana back. Now, Ozzy, on the other hand, you have... Ozzy trying to do Ozzy things in a very specific way, and he's trying to shoehorn these other guitarists in. Now, whether or not Andrew Watt intended it to be that way and to sound that way, but that's the way that it comes across. Like with the, the Mike McCready song, it sounds like a Pearl Jam song, or it sounds like a 90s era grunge song, and Ozzy's still trying to do his signature Aussie sound on here and it just doesn't work it's weird it, but it, do you want Aussie to not sound like Aussie I, mean, I want I, that goes to the, the question the damn if you damn if you don't because if he didn't do an album that sounded like Aussie we'd be kind of trashing it wouldn't we Aussie can come on and sing and do different things like let's talk about his duet with Lita Ford but that was so many years ago. I know it was so many years ago but still Aussie has the capability to do different things he doesn't have to just sound like 80s era Ozzy. He's just got to do something that supports him being him. And that's why I think some of the Zach Wilde songs work on here because it supports him being Ozzy. Now, whether or not that's because Zach has worked with Ozzy for so long and they kind of understand each other. And then Tony Iommi bringing in like the Black Sabbath vibes on here. It supports what Ozzy does and it supports how Ozzy is. Now, it's not necessarily stretching his musicianship to a whole nother level, but at least it's bringing Ozzy to a point where this is Ozzy and it feels good that he's doing Ozzy things in a realm that makes sense. It's if you took Ozzy and you dropped him on the, that Santana album. I mean, first off, I think that'd be amazing, <laughs> especially if it was done like it was back then. Um, in, you know, adding some additional flavor, you know, into it. But I just think that Ozzy should do his own thing and not make it seem like they're trying so hard because that's what it sounded very forced in certain spots on this album, especially the last three songs. So I would go into the idea that sounds forced and maybe this is because I do want to touch on also the idea of do we expect too much from Ozzy? I'll get to that in a second, though. In regards to the sound, I think, I mean, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of talking too much about Andrew Watt, because I think we touched upon a lot of the flaws in his production and guitar work also, because I'm sure he played guitar on most of this album still, too. Uh, we talked yes. about his flaws a lot when we reviewed Ordinary Man, Man. And I also feel bad because for a guy like Andrew Watt, who is so injected into pop culture, I mean, you, you can't fault the guy for wanting to bring rock to the mainstream I mean, he's helped get pop stars like miley cyrus and post malone interjected with a lot of our favorite rock bands he means well but i can't help but think that a big flaw of this album is just how overproduced it sounds and the other problem with there's so many guitars being inserted here and this is where i think it differs also and maybe why it works less than the santana case is at no point did I feel, oh, wow, I'm hearing Jeff Beck and Ozzy Osbourne jamming in a studio together. No, I felt like I was hearing Jeff Beck emailing his guitar parts to Andrew Watt, yes. who then inserted Ozzy's vocals on top. Or yes. I you know, Andrew Watt 
having Chad Smith and Duff McKagan or Chris, um, formerly James Addiction, or and Robert. I'm sorry, I have to add his name, Robert Trujillo, back from Metallica, back in Ozzy's band, recording a lot of the parts here too. He had them record their parts, and then Ozzy, once everything was done, insert his vocals. Maybe yeah. that's where I'm really having the problem here is that I don't feel like this is an Ozzy album. This was Andrew Watt Frankensteining a bunch of pieces digitally emailed to him. Yeah, absolutely. Andrew Watt to me seems like the kid who's home alone for the weekend with his father's Ferrari keys and he's just doing whatever the hell he wants with the car. That's what it feels like. What a great freaking description. You nailed it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I felt that the, the moment I heard Ordinary Man. And you know what's crazy? I feel like if this was an Andrew Watts solo album, that he formed a super group of these musicians, and it just so happened that Ozzy was his vocalist, I would maybe feel a little less judgy about this album, but then maybe not, because again, it still goes to the point of, at no point do I feel like, because on, again, on paper, Chad Smith, Robert Trujillo, and Zach Wilde jamming with Ozzy, or insert any other guitarist, jamming with Ozzy to produce the ultimate metal album should be great. But at no point do I feel like they were actually in a room together. Yeah, absolutely. And there's ways to, and I'm not dumb, of course, there's millions of records that are made like that. There's millions of bands who actually are a band that create albums on the opposite ends of the country. But there's still ways with the right production to trick you into thinking that they actually wore a band in the same room creating this music. I think back to when we reviewed Churches from Screen Violence. Granted, very different type of music, pop, dance, electro, a little bit easier to manipulate the sound. But it's amazing that they recorded that album so different separately from each other on opposite ends of the world. And it sounded so in unison. And I don't get that from here. And I feel maybe not the word, insult, maybe it's too harsh to say insulted, but I feel like them trying to say, yeah, this is the ultimate rock record, rock gods coming together. It's like, no, no, none of these musicians came together. You sent some few emails and you got responses from Eric Clapton saying, yeah, I'll contribute for this price. Yeah. It also, and this is going to be more of an extreme example. It feels like, you know, when you go, when you were younger and you went to the, the, the record store and you picked up what you thought was going to be an awesome, like, cover album, and it ended up being a bunch of shitty bands that were on there covering songs that, that you know, people, you know that they just threw it together to get money for the label because it, it was a, a cover album of, for the sake of argument, Metallica, and it was these no-name bands, you know, when you put it in, like, what the hell am I and listening to? And one Motorhead cover that they had and, recorded years ago. Right, and one one motorhead, yeah, exactly. To get the motorhead yeah. cover, you got all these shitty bands. That's what that's what this is. That's exactly what this is. So then that leads me to the question of so I mean, I think we both agree that a big flaw of this album is that it just doesn't feel genuine. Going back to the question of are we expecting too much from Ozzy at this point? I don't think so. To be Why honest. Not? Because Ozzy, for him to still want to get up and perform on stage and know that he has it. It says a lot about Ozzy because I think Ozzy would probably, uh, you know, say when. Like, I don't think he's that naive. Oh, I, I think he is. I don't I think so. I absolutely think he is. I think it was a fl so background a little bit. We got Matt and I, I've seen Ozzy numerous times. I always have a blast seeing yeah. Ozzy live. Um, but I still say when we, Matt and I and our wives went to see Ozzy on the No More Tours 2 tour, which should, Right there, that name of the head of the name of the tour itself should speak volumes. The fact that Ozzy was as good and fun live was a miracle. And I even said, um, so in the past, if you have to pick three episodes where we named the artists that we hope never retire, when we kind of switched it at the end and asked which artists we do hope retire soon, I hate even saying this out loud, but I do hope Ozzy calls it quits because I don't know if he still has it. And I don't know if he would even recognize he still has it. He's been on more farewell tours at this point than you can count. Yeah, but every time he comes back. back, every time he comes back, though, it's still good. It's like Kiss. It's like, still good, but like. And I don't like Kiss. Fate. He's just pushing fate at this point. 
I mean, you could say that about a bunch of artists. I mean, there's very few artists that I think I, I would say, you know, it's time. Like if Phil Collins said, I'm going to continue to go on. And after seeing, I, I forget if it was him solo or if it was the Genesis tour, but he was like sitting down and oh yeah, he can't even stand on stage. I anymore, know, but I mean, let alone he, play drums. Exactly. If he said that he was going to continue on after that, I would say, I think it's time for you to hang it up at that point. I don't think Ozzy's at that point. And I think Ozzy, you know, I'm going to say it this way, and this is a terrible way to say it, but I think COVID actually did him good to just not do anything for a while and get back, you know, some of your health. And from all of like the, the trouble that he's had over the years, falling off of like quads and, you know, breaking things, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's, everything, just giving him time. I mean, I, I will think say it is amazing that having suffered from, that disease for so long and, and quietness that he's been able to do as much as he has. But leads to my point is that does he owe, does Ozzy owe us anything at this point? No, uh, no. Ozzy doesn't why, owe anybody anything. Why do we ha put him on such a high pedestal? We set ha such a high standard for new, new material from Ozzy. Because you're choosing to put out new material and assholes like us on the internet are going to critique it. <laughs> I'm <laughs> going like, to call a spade a spade. But then, like, so for instance, are you? Would you actually look me straight in the face and say that ACDC's last album, Power Up, was actually that much better than Ozzy's Patient Number Nine? Yes. Why? Because it's it was ACDC being ACDC, no matter how mediocre it is. Because so what, let's on, let's face it. 90s ACDC was not great. 2000s ACDC was okay. I mean, there. if you love ACDC, you're going to get the same rock out of ACDC on every album, and you're not going to get anything innovative. And when it's good, it's good. And when it's mediocre, it's mediocre. I mean, you, you when you go to McDonald's, you're going to get a McDonald's hamburger. You're not going to get, like, the most prime hamburger you've ever had. It's not even like diner quality hamburgers. It's just a McDonald's hamburger. It's its own thing. And ACDC rock is ACDC rock. But then why do we hold? Why is it okay for ACDC? It's not. To be just for good as ACDC when we critique Ozzy. Or why do I feel I, so let down by Ozzy Osbourne for releasing a half ass album? Other than, I guess... Kind of touching, we kind of answered this, but like just feeling that it's such a just genuine album. Maybe because two things. A, you love Ozzy. And B, you expect more out of him than you probably ever have ACDC. Because you've experienced good Ozzy. Like you've experienced good Ozzy albums. ACDC's albums are okay. They're serviceable. You know, they, they do the job. But you've, seen good Ozzy albums come out and you've admitted that earlier in this episode about osmosis that you think it's a very underrated album which i think means that you enjoy it and you like it i just i guess i'm still just torn up about how like there's stuff on this album that should make me go yeah and i just can't get myself there you know when, when it seems like so many is it just that so many people are just so blinded by the fact that it's Ozzy or is there actually something I'm missing? And it sounds like it's the former a little bit in that, I guess it, it, maybe the real true test of time will be in a year or two. Will anyone remember this album? I don't think so. And here's why in very, and once again, I'm going to go back to the Santana analogy. Santana's band can handle those songs or some of the songs off of that album and still do a really great job. Like they launched smooth all over the radio it became one of the biggest songs of the i think it was the song of the year that year and they still perform it live and it still does really great live even though rob thomas maybe has only performed it with them a handful of times in order to get the flavor of the guitar playing you need specific hands specific equipment and you need the knowledge of what somebody like clapton or jeff beck or mike mccready put into the songs like 
anybody can go up and sing a song and cover a song. And I'm not taking away from Santana's band at all because it sounds incredible. But to sing that song and perform that song, I think it takes a lot less than it does to accurately translate that into a guitar. Like the guitar is very, very, very nuanced in how each different person approaches it. I'm sure singing is the same way. However, you're not, it's not going to feel like Eric Clapton performing on a song. It's not going to feel like Jeff Beck. And when you start doing that, especially in this realm of rock and metal where Santana's album was a little bit more pop, and I think pop is a little bit more forgiving in that sense, I'm sure I'm going to get ripped to shreds about that. But anyway, I just think that those songs – with Zach Wilde touring behind it, they're going to perform the Zach Wilde songs predominantly. I, and everything and everything else is kind of just gonna fade away. Maybe it also goes goes back to the problem of I just can't envision any of the musicians actually playing it live. And I think it's even more so are, are the songs actually that good or memorable? I think the title track, Patient Number Nine, could have been an awesome song and could have translated well live. Not to shit on Jeff Beck, but something with the production, going back to that production question, just something about it fell off. And I feel like if there and if there's a something, if the production made it feel more lively, and if some of the arrangement and some of the better higher end songs were a little bit tighter and didn't feel so choppy, because going back to Mr. Darkness, my biggest problem is that you go from a really awesome Ozzy song. Out of nowhere, it just felt like it was cut from another song that they're like, you know what? Let's just take this part from it and insert it in the middle here. And it loses its liveliness. It loses something. I don't know if maybe the answer would have been just say, screw it and have Zach Wilde play on the entire album or get a producer who knows how to get a live sound out of that room. And granted, in Andrew Watts' defense, when you, if you one, when you get that many all-stars on an album, it's going to be nearly impossible to get them in the same room. And even for, if you didn't get all those all-stars, let's be real. And maybe this is another problem I have with it, is that I have a hard time believing that what we hear of Ozzy was just him in the, studio, in the vocal booth singing. I'm sure a lot of work had to go into even making Ozzy sound in key and with everything. And it kills me to say that, too. Unfortunately, maybe we're at the point of we can't get a natural sounding Ozzy album out if we, because he's just not at that level anymore. God, I, I hate saying that out loud. Okay. We're going off of two albums that were produced by a producer who we think is subpar. Let's, let's call a spade a spade here, right? I think that if you take the keys out of the hands of Andrew Watt and turn them over to somebody else, maybe a Rick Rubin. Well, I was hold on. I was going to actually ask you this since mm -hmm. you brought up Rick Rubin too. What did you think of Black Sabbath's Thirteen? I liked it. Why did you think it? I mean, I liked it too, but I'm curious. Why did you think that worked? Because it brought together three out of the four original members, and I think it brought a sense of authenticity to it, and translated it in a way where. It's a modern day Black Sabbath and we're not trying to recreate the past but move forward with a band and their sound. Like I've said this a couple times now. I think that if Freddie Mercury never died, I think that Queen would be doing stuff similar to what Muse is doing. And I stand by that and I stand by that Black Sabbath is able to get back together and do new things and we can see what a modern day Black Sabbath sounds like. And this is the result of it. Normally, I'm all about Rick Rubin, too. But it's interesting because I feel like the more years we get away from 13's release, I still like it. I still have fond memories of liking it. But definitely there's been more outspoken critics of it. Even Geezer Butler has kind of been like, eh, you know, some of the ideas that Rick Rubin brought were not that great when he did show up. Uh, so I, well, I mean, I, that, that's I just a name, that, but insert insert name that's not Andrew Watt and a good producer here. Yeah, you know what? I would challenge us because I believe 
a certain anniversary of that album uh, is coming up. Black Sabbath 13, I believe, is going to be turning 10 in a few months from when we are recording this episode as I speak. I think we need to challenge ourselves to do a two minutes review revisit of that album because I'm very curious as to whether. Because I, I admit also it's been a while since I've heard it. I wonder if it still holds up as well as I remember it holding up. So just throwing that out there to all of our listeners, be on the lookout. We're going to probably revisit Black Sabbath 13 very soon. So I think maybe wrapping up real quick. So, I mean, clearly we talked about, Al, you know, Ozzy, you know, disappointing us, I think is fair to say. Was there an artist with a similar lever, level of legacy? You talked about Carlos Santana, but I'm thinking more of the recent past five or so years that you were so impressed that after all of this time really delivered the goods for you? Because mm. I can, one album that comes to mind immediately. Go ahead. Was actually, one of the albums that we named as our favorite of 2018, Judas Priest's Firepower. Blew that was me a good away one. With how, and granted, the, f- the last few albums prior to that were kind of lackluster. But that album, and maybe this kind of goes into, because I'm also trying to think of, are there producers I would love to see Ozzy with? I think what made that album so awesome, besides the fact that the songs were great, the production was great. And I think Andy Sneap played a huge role in that. I would love to have a producer who, like Andy, knows how to capture natural rawness, if that makes sense. So I'm going to go a little bit of a different route than you. The first one I think we can agree hands down is Alice in Chains, Black is Way to Blue. Yeah. So I mean, we we did a past Am I Missing Something episode when we talked about reunions and how that album proved that they did everything right, despite the odds being against them. And then another one that's a little bit different, Blink-182's California. Thank you. That's an incredible album. <laughs> it's funny. We uh, in a past episode of Two Minutes Review, we kind of we talked about Blink 182's Nine, and how disappointed we are we were in that album because California was such a surprisingly good album. It was very authentic to Blink 182 and the age that the guys were at, and the feeling in the songs felt way more mature than Nine. Nine yes. sounded like we're trying to going back to being 16 and 17 and being a band in not necessarily a band in the garage again, but like a pop punk band talking about things that 16 and 17 year olds really resonate with rather than, you know, you know, three aging musicians. Nine was them trying to sound like they were currently 16 year olds, like yes. in the current scene. Whereas yeah, like you mentioned, I literally felt like, all right, this is the mature Blink-182. I want to sound like them still having that old sound and capture it but being reflective being recognizing yeah i am old but this was such a huge part of my life yes and it it hit all the right nostalgic moments and maybe that's what i'm missing in patient number nine it's lacking the nostalgic moments that i would want from ozzy in 2022 maybe not from an ozzy record but in ozzy 2022 it just it's so hard for bands to capture that. And maybe that's where I go, but keep going back to, am I expecting too much? And see, I would disagree with that a little bit because the nostalgia aspect of Blink-182 is really in name only on California because you don't have all three original uh, original no, members. That's fair. Yeah, but you can argue that Matt, with his experience, uh, Matt Skiba, with his experience of Alkaline Trio, granted, as of recording this episode right now, it's not very clear if Matt is still in the band and if Tom has come back, but we're talking. I actually would argue that Blink 182 lucked out with Matt and being able to find someone who could relate to what they've been through in the scene with just the years of touring and their love of punk as well. I, I, I would maybe that's what made it so authentic, even without Tom there, is that it was three guys who I believed had grown up in the scene who have grown up and matured, but can still look back fondly on their time in the past. Right, but if you want the Blink-182 that did Enema of the State, you're not going to get that band here. You're going to get a band with with a slightly different sound and sounding 
way more mature like they should. And I think that if they do decide to do another album, and you can mark me as saying this, and I'm sure we're going to review the album if it ever does happen, <laughs> that the band in 2016 sounded exactly the way they should have sounded and should continue to sound. And if they do decide to do another album in the future and they do try to do that young sound again, that it's it might fall flat. You and know what? I'm, I'm going to make a uh, controversial um, statement here. I would argue that Ozzy Osbourne did make that mature sounding album in 2001 with Down to Earth. That's an album that, granted, maybe I'm remembering it better than it really deserves to be remembered for, but I actually always thought that album was also underrated. Uh, Gets Me Through was not the classic sounding Ozzy heavy riffer, but still Slade. I love that song. I thought it was a great song. Dreamer was the ballad that no one expected Ozzy to ever do, but still was great and emotional. Hence his range. Yeah, it's. I actually, with a few missteps for sure, I actually thought that was a solid, mature Ozzy record. And ever since then, with a few, you know, hits, mostly misses, it's always been Ozzy kind of doing overproduced albums just to release it. You know, there's another thing too that I think might be missing from this album. And I'm starting to think of a trend that happened where everybody tried to make these larger than life sounding albums throughout the, the early 2010s. It just, everybody trying to make these big, big, big sounding albums. And then all of a sudden now it's like, tight and squashed and overproduced and you know just very hey let's let's relive the mistakes that metallica made with you know production where you're running it like right into the red and you you shouldn't do that because it doesn't sound good and i think that ozzy may suffer from a little bit of that on here because think of some of ozzy's best songs like think of like what does no more tears sound like no more tears is that big open epic sounding song and Crazy Train, you know, it's not the biggest song, but it's still got that big vibe to it. It's got that big feel to it. Bark at the Moon has that big feel to it. There's no big feel to Ozzy now. And I think that's a very big detriment to having somebody who is young producing him. You need somebody who understands what people may want, like you may want from Ozzy, which is that big classic sound that is quite frankly missed in a lot of modern music as big and larger than life as those songs that you just mentioned were i think it goes back to the overproduced part it's not necessarily that because i think the way you're saying it makes it sound like oh it's you know them just trying to capture a raw sound if they definitely in andrew's defense he definitely tries to i feel like tries again keyword tries to capture that big sound but you're not going to you're you're missing that liveliness aspect to it. The I go back to can I envision the people on that album playing it live? And there's so many parts on that as I'm listening to it. I'm like, okay, cool. You got Chad Smith to play on the drums on this song. But did he? I guess it goes to your point. It's so overproduced that I don't buy that I could ever actually hear it live and enjoy it live either without questioning whether it's a track being played over in the background. And yeah, see, that's the thing. Like I could envision his 2010 album scream. I can picture that being played in the studio. I can picture it being played live because I saw it live, but it felt like Ozzy. None of this new stuff really feels like what you would expect Ozzy to feel like. Now, granted, the song Soul Sucker really wasn't a great song, but... And I was actually going to say, there, as, as, there's, as there's underappreciated as that album is, there's definitely a lot of... And that, it definitely was an overproduced album. I will say, the role of Ozzy's guitarist almost used to be kind of like James Bond in that it was a prestigious role for an actor to have. And it's kind of an honor to be able to say, yeah, I played on Ozzy's album. And it kind of feels dampered when you have so many different guitars, as legendary as they are, 
taking over solos here and there. And it loses the dynamic because as much as Ozzy is a solo artist, he's always been able to bring a great band together. Mm -hmm. And that's also kind of the reason why this feel this album, in my opinion, feels like it's a tryout for guitarists because you're not sticking to one. You're throwing a whole bunch of them together and all right, well, maybe some of this will work. But it's a tryout for guitarists among among auditioners who don't want the gig. I mean, they want to play on the album, but it's like, okay, cool. You got the gig. It's like, well, no, I'm Jeff Beck. I'm not going to tour the world with you, Ozzy. That's well, so right. So let's talk about that. Kind like, it's kind of like interviewing a bunch of candidates for a job that as soon as you, as soon as you make offers, they're going to be like, oh, sorry, I got another gig. Right. And that's what I think makes this feel phoned in. Like, let's like take your favorite guitarist now, right? Your favorite hot guitarist right now and tell him, hey, you are you have a chance to play in Ozzy's band, right? That performance is going to feel and if he happens, he or she happens to love Ozzy and wants to and can handle the role and wants to do it. That performance is going to be so much better than I think these other guys because Jeff Beck, Clapton, Mike McCready, they don't need to play in Ozzy's band. Like, think about it. How many people wanted to play in Ozzy's band after Randy Rhodes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Think that's how what, that's what made but, Gus G. That's what for as meant of an album as Scream might be. That's what made at least the album fun is that you heard musicians want to be in the room. Right. And you heard that you heard that in the performance. Yeah. These these performances are from legends in the industry who, you know, they they just want a paycheck. Maybe they had some spare time on the weekend and they, they played a track and they sent or it at back. Best, or at best they were like, okay, that'll be fun to do an Aussie album, but there's no passion behind their no, performances. No, not an album. A song or You're, two. Good, good. Yep. Yeah, fair yeah. point. Fair. It'd be it'd be fun to play an Ozzy song. Okay, here you go. And it's it's a really the definition of a phoned in performance. If Ozzy had another modern guitar player not named Andrew Watt on here and could handle the gig as per what Ozzy's vision is, let them do it. Don't do this again. If he does this a third time and does it with Andrew Watt and brings this all-star musician thing together again, I liked the idea of Chad Smith. I like the idea of Robert Trujillo. I don't necessarily think you need the biggest name on guitar, but you need somebody there who wants to be a part of the act. Here's a final question. If you could choose that guitar like let's say all right you only get one guitarist to whether it's permanently join ozzy's band or play on the entire album and zach wilde's not available which guitarist would be your dream to see play an ozzy album i have an answer but i want to hear your answer first i think i'm actually going to go with the first name that popped in my head mark tremonti i had a feeling you're going to say that and i think that actually would be a phenomenal get I actually, I think we talked about that. I'll, I'll say my pick in a second, but I think Mark Tremonti would be a phenomenal player for Ozzy. And Walk, oh, why am I blanking on the last album? Walk the Sky. Walk the, walk the Sky. When we were reviewing that, I even noted that some of these songs sound like modern day, uh, they could have been a great modern day Ozzy song, like an actually well-written stuff. I think his guitar work would have been tremendous for Ozzy. The guitarist I would have picked Granted, she's definitely more of a virtuoso player, but her solo stuff has actually proven that she can do some just solid riffs as well. Nita Strauss. Uh, she used to be in Alice Cooper's band. She's currently playing with Danny Lovato, which is a little weird of, an, of a twist and turn because it's definitely more of a pop punk kind of sound that Demi's going for now. But uh, Nita's still killing it with her and even helping elevate that music just by her presence playing with her live. But Nita has is a phenomenal guitar player. She's got an incredible stage presence too. Even she's talked about how she had to learn how to transition from being in a cover band for Iron, like an Iron Maiden cover band, the Iron Maidens, that was much more technical and had to transition to more classic rock vibe with the Alice Cooper band. 
I actually think Ozzy's band would be a perfect fit for her in the balance of just riffs and technicality. Uh, Cause she's not just someone who shreds for the sake of shredding. Like she, she knows what she's doing. I think granted, I don't think Sharon ever let Ozzy on stage with Nita out of fear that Ozzy would misbehave cause he's a dirty dog and God, that's how it got him in trouble. The last time he was alone with a woman. Uh, that's a different topic, but I think actually Nita would be really cool to hear what she could do if given the chance. All right. I got another one. I Go know ahead. we said John five. Yeah. Blasco has been in Ozzy's band for a while. Granted, at this point, I don't know, because he hasn't been playing based on his the few live performances he's done in the last few years. But when we saw him last in 2018, Blasco was still in his band. He'd been doing it for almost two decades at this point. And in 2010, when Tommy Clufettos, who was in Rob Zombie's band, joined Ozzy's band, a lot of jokes were like, oh, he keeps stealing Rob Zombie's bandmates. And Rob Zombie was actually even pissed about it. And the joke was also like, you know, oh, he's got to be covering, he's he's got to be hiding John Five in a basement. Yeah, John Five would be a phenomenal. It's almost too good to imagine. I have to believe that Ozzy's made numerous offers to John Five, but John, being the standout guy he is, he's like, no, I can't do that to Rob. Although when I've interviewed John Five, he's always I because for Metal Insider, I got to interview him at least twice, I think twice, at least once. And he talked about how much he just loves playing in Rob Zombie's band. And and whenever, it, that always takes his priority because he just constantly has fun in it. So, But that would be cool to hear a John 5 album and Ozzy. There is ways to bring Ozzy back from the, the dead. Sorry to, <laughs> sorry to call his last two albums that, but I mean, there's ways to bring him back. And I think he's owed one more album, Andrew Wattless. And seeing where that goes, because if he can come back, you know, and do something, maybe one more, I don't want to say classic Ozzy album, but one more album where it's well produced with a guitarist who really wants to be in the band, whether it's Zach or not, just as long as it's not Andrew Watt, you know, what? I I think it's worth a shot. The key, though, is. And I, I think it's funny because we we point out the guitar part so much because I think that going back to Randy, the guitars were so important to Ozzy's music. And you need to have someone who's actually in it for the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. On an Ozzy album. I think back to when, and granted, it was a covers album, so that definitely doesn't help. But I think back to the cover album that Ozzy did back in 2005, and he had Jerry Cantrell play guitar on it. On paper... That's incredible. That's a Mm -hmm. match made in heaven. But as a result, you got someone who really just was like, yeah, I'm just recording, you know, I'm recording of an idol. This will be fun, but it's just for this session. And you can definitely hear the difference between someone who is like, no, this is my job. This is what I've been playing for my whole life. As opposed to just uh, an all-star musician going, oh, wow, I get to play an, on an Ozzy album. Oh, but I got to make sure to leave by 5 o'clock because that's when my band's rehearsals start. Why are you talking about St. Anger now? <laughs> you know, it's always about St. Anger. Always. But I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Thank you for making me, Matt, feel like I'm not as crazy for the way I've been feeling about this album. I'm on the same page as you. This wasn't the greatest Ozzy album in the world. It's also not the worst Ozzy album in the world, but it is definitely in like the 10 cent bin, in my opinion. Well, those who are listening, do you agree with us? Do you think we're so silly and full of it that we are just the jaded fans that I was talking about in the beginning? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Epic Footnote. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, to hear more episodes like this as well as reviews like the last Ozzy album that we did and thank you to Lucky 13 Beer Cup use the code EFP10 at checkout to get 10% off of your entire order all beard bombs and oils that they have on the site throw them in your cart including our Lemmy inspired beard oil bourbon tobacco cola leather you are not going to be disappointed in how this thing smells it is incredible your beard is going to feel rejuvenated and you're going to smell like rock and roll because it's inspired by lemmy so use the code efb10 10 off of the lemmy and anything else in your cart lucky 13 
the number beardco.com. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you join us for another episode real, real soon. Mama, I'm coming home. I love you all. <laughs>